We've had another look at our bill coil and we've added a single wire so that you can do the required A-level practical as prescribed, as well as amplifying the bill effect without the need for a very long magnet, so that we can easily and convincingly demonstrate the principles of electromagnetism, magnetic levitation, and of course calculating B, the magnetic field strength. So before we start, welcome back to the LaSalle's YouTube channel. This is a safe space to learn, get comfortable with practical physics at your own pace, and most importantly, ask questions we can help you in the comments. In this video we're going to look at the A-level physics practical of investigating the force on a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field. So what's the big idea here? Well we're using a magnetic field and running a current through a wire that sits inside of that field. Now according to the motor effect a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field experiences a force. That force can actually make the wire move and today we're going to measure it, plot it and prove that F equals B I L. But why bother? Why is this all important? Well, you might have heard me call this the motor effect earlier, and this is because it tells us how a motor works. It explains how we turn electrical energy into mechanical energy. It's the physics behind the generators that produce the power to run our whole society, robotic arms, electric cars, loudspeakers, the list goes on. If you have any other cool applications that you use to engage your students, please drop them in the comments so others can use them too. Now, the wire I'm going to use for this experiment is embedded in this pattern here, which we call the bill coil. We have tappings on this unit for one length, five lengths and ten lengths. This means that on top of doing the required practical, we can also easily look at how the length of the wire in the magnetic field affects the system. Not only that, but this is super easy to suspend in a magnetic field. You don't need any crop clips and you only need one retort stand to support it. Okay, so here I have a yoke with magnets attached to the top of either side. It's important that these are arranged so that they attract, so north on one side and south on the other. If you have a bar magnet or a compass, you can check which way round you've got them. So doing this, I can see that this side is north and this side is south, and we know that magnetic field lines always run from north to south, so our magnetic field vector B is pointing in this direction, from north to south. Now this yoke needs to sit on top of a top pan balance so that we can measure the force that's operating here. Now, strictly speaking, we'll be measuring the mass, but we can easily convert this to force or weight using F equals mg, where F is the force, m is the mass reading that will take off the balance, and g is the acceleration due to gravity. Now, we're not interested in the mass of the magnet, so we can simply tear the scale to get the measured mass back to zero. This means that the values that we read off the balance will only be due to the forces that are operating between the magnet and the wire. So now the yoke is the right height, we can look to suspend the bill coil. I've got it clamped here so that I can just bring it down into the magnetic field. Now to get the right height, we can position it so that it's close to one of the magnets, and we can position it so that the magnet placement area, as shown on the bill coil, is in line with the magnet on the yoke. Once we have the height right, we want to position the bill coil bang in the middle of the field. This is because it's where the field is most uniform, so the maths that backs up the physics of what's happening here is valid. We also need to make sure that the wire is perpendicular to the field, as the angle will affect our readings. We also need to attach an ammeter in series and connect to the PSU. You'll see here that I'm using our precision variable power supply. This lets me vary the voltage output continuously, so with this there is no need for a rheostat. I can get all the fine tuning I need simply using this rotary knob. Now you will have noticed that just having the wire suspended in the magnetic field hasn't changed the mass value on the balance. We are still at 0.00 grams. So simply having the non-magnetic copper wire inside of this magnetic field isn't producing any net force. So what happens when we pass a current through the wire? we start to see the mass reading on the balance increase. So what is happening here? Well, when we pass a current through a wire, that wire creates its own magnetic field. This is known as Ampere's law, and it's the foundation of electromagnetism. What this essentially means is that this piece of copper wire, which was originally not magnetic, is now acting as a magnet due to the current that's passing through it. Therefore, the wire is presenting a force on the permanent magnet, now we know from the positive reading that it's a repulsive force and the magnet is being pushed downwards. Now according to Newton's third law, there will be an equal and opposite force from the permanent magnet on the wire. This comes from the sum of the Lorentz forces on the charges or current in the wire and this is equal to BIL. We can check with the left hand rule that the direction is correct 
So our index finger points in the direction of the magnetic field and our middle finger points in the direction of the conventional current from the anode to the cathode or from the positive to the negative. And this shows that the resulting force is upwards. So what we're doing here is equating the upwards force F equals BIL to the downwards force MG. And by doing so, we can rearrange the equation to get M. So we see that a plot of mass on the y-axis against current on the x will provide us with a gradient of B L over G. We can then use this to work out B, the magnetic flux density or magnetic field strength of the permanent magnet. Now to collect our data set, we want to incrementally increase the current through the wire, which I can do by delicately changing the voltage on the PSU. We take readings in 0.5 amp steps and take corresponding readings for the mass. For the full data set, we'll go from 0 to 7 amps in 0.5 amp steps and collect a good bank of data to model that linear relationship. Let's head to Excel and I'll show you what to do with the data. So here is my data set for the Bill Coyle experiment where I've had one length of wire suspended in a permanent magnetic field. So in column A, I've got my values of current in amps and in column B, I've got my values for mass in grams. Now you'll see with the plot, I have plotted mass in grams on the y-axis against current in amps on the x. And I've got this negative negative region down here by swapping the polarity on the power supply. And you'll see that this has given me a data set that goes perfectly through the origin. And we've got a really nice fit as characterized by this R squared value here, which is super, super close to one. So this shows that this is a really good data set. I've also given Excel values for little g, so that's the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. I've given it a value for L, the length of the wire, which was 5 centimeters or 0.05 meters. And then the value for the gradient um, that I've just plugged straight from the linear fit from Excel is this, 0.1666. And the units for that are grams per amp. So I've done what's on the y-axis divided by what's on the x, and I need to convert that into SI units. So to get that into kilograms, I just need to divide that value by a thousand. Then to actually work out B, the magnetic field strength, I need the formula, which is the acceleration due to gravity, time by the gradient divided by the length of the wire and when I do that I get a value of 0.0327 tesla to 3 sig fig so to get that into something more sensible like milli tesla we can divide sorry we can times that value by a thousand and that gives me 32.7 milli tesla as our calculated magnetic field strength so how do we know if we've calculated the right value we could do with a device that can measure the magnetic field strength directly and for that we have a hall probe so this device will measure the magnetic field strength and give us the readout in tesla on the digital display so here is the probe i'm going to put it in the magnetic field Field and see what reading we get. So here it's giving us a reading of about 32 millitesla. So this value is really close to our calculated value showing that we're in the right ballpark and we've done some good physics here. Now if you've got to this point and your graph looks off or your balance is a bit rubbish, let me give you some tips to try and get things working for you. Okay, so first off, if your scales are struggling to measure any mass change, it's possible to use a different tapping on the bill coil. By increasing the length of the wire in the magnetic field, we can increase the force. This will mean that you'll get larger readings on the balance and should help with lower resolution or less sensitive equipment. Just be sure to account for the extra length when you're doing your calculations. So total length for the five tapping will be five times five centimeters. And similarly, total length for the 10 tapping will be 10 times five centimeters. Additionally, if you need more oomph, you can increase the magnetic field strength by using more than one magnet on each side of the yoke. Obviously, make sure you increase both sides at the same amount to make sure that that magnetic field stays uniform across the gap. With these cheap balances, sometimes they drift during the experiment. If that's an issue for you, you can tear the balance before each measurement. So take a measurement and write your values down, then turn off the power supply so that no current is passing through the wire, resulting in zero force or zero mass, and then re-tear the balance at this point and you're ready to turn the PSU back on and take your next measurement. This should help in getting a nice straight line that passes through the origin. Now, if you want more data points, you can reverse the polarity on the power supply and take readings for negative mass for negative current or current flowing in the opposite direction. This will also hammer home the point that the graph should travel through the origin and that the force direction depends on the way that the current travels through the wire, again coming back to the left-hand rule. 
In terms of safety, just make sure that you don't have a large current flowing through the bill coil for extended periods of time. The resistance of the wire is really low here, so we see that even at low voltages, we're getting a very high current flow. So this can get quite warm quite quickly. So thank you very much for watching. It's been a super busy summer hosting workshops for science teachers and technicians, and it's been really lovely meeting you all. We'll be back at full force with video content in September, so have a lovely summer.